you, Ruchi, uh, for doing this research under the conditions that you have explained. And as said, you have played a key role uh, to link all those women uh, journalists with the international community. And uh, I just want to, to take one of the points you have raised, which is linked to uh, what Guilherme said about here the responsibility of the uh, corporations, the media corporations with uh, these women journalists. So uh, at GAMAG, we are planning as a follow-up of this uh, first step uh, and how to, uh, to call the attention of these corporations uh, for ensuring uh, working conditions uh, for these women in and out uh, the country. So now is the turn of uh, the, uh, the Mexico case. Uh, and my colleague Lucia Lagunes and I will introduce to you some of the main findi findings. The last two years, uh, 65 journalists have been murdered in Mexico. This year, eight journalists have been killed. Just yesterday, a journalist was assassinated in the state of Michoacán. Because of the gender condition, the level of risk of women journalists is higher. According to our research, Vulnerable conditions have increased during the pandemic. Women journalists in Mexico have faced different types of violence, such as physical, psychological, sexual, economic, and femicides in their workplaces and uh, at their homes. The Mexican government has uh, so far done little to address the problem. In fact, in October 2020, the Congress approved the presidential initiative of eliminating the trust fund that had allowed uh, the protection mechanism for human rights defenders and journalists to implement protection measures that have helped uh, protect more than uh, 1,700 people who were on the, on the treat. The lack of human and financial resources has dramatically uh, limited the mechanism capacity to do its job properly. Currently, the Mexican government is planning to substitute the existing law by a new one that represents a serious risk for journalists and human rights defenders. My colleague Lucia Lagunes will explain further on this. In addition to that, the Mexican president has launched a public hostility toward journalists during his daily morning press briefings that has exacerbated the risk conditions for those women journalists who have challenged his policies, including those in response to the COVID pandemic and the persisting impunity. The report in Mexico undertook a comprehensive research of the mechanisms, its structure and the path followed for the improvement of protection measures for women journalists. Researchers were able to access to existing statistical data on women journalists victims of violence that have requested protection to the mechanism. Also, we interviewed representatives of the mechanism, but also of those institutions, organizations, and UN agencies represented at the governing board. An interview to a displaced a woman journalist under the protection of the mechanism was, was included. And uh, as my colleagues in Iraq, and Afghanistan, we also did a survey uh, with a Mexican uh, journalist. Uh, I would want to share with you some uh, of the numbers. Okay, uh, we interviewed 137 uh, women journalists around the country, and uh, some of them were uh, reporters, but also we included a, a women working in other fields, uh, also uh, in internet media, uh, press, TV, radio, and uh, other media. Uh, okay, uh, at the beginning, Guilherme Canela spoke about the importance that uh, digital violence is, um, is, is, that, that is, is raising this issue. However, what we found, and we want to emphasize it, this is that online violence against women journalists is a continuous of the offline violence that they experience. So in our survey, we included these dimensions of violence against women journalists, uh, uh, such as physical violence, sexual, psychological, economic, patrimonial, and uh, femicide. 
So uh, what you will see is that uh, women journalists in Mexico experience different types of violence linked to the gender condition. In the case of physical violence, uh, you can see here, and we can share uh, after this session, the results of uh, the survey, uh, that they experience different specific types of physical violence, but also of uh, sexual violence, psychological violence, economic, uh, patrimonial, and some of them have been uh, treated of uh, being murdered. Um, also, what we have uh, found is that the spaces where uh, they have been uh, treated or uh, pushed, uh, punished uh, are places linked to their work. So here also we want to emphasize the importance of uh, approaching to the analysis of gender-based uh, violence against women journalists uh, as, uh, a, um, as an attempt to the work they do and uh, at the end of the day, as an attempt to freedom of expression and to the access of information of society. And in the case of online violence, uh, what, what we have seen is that uh, there is an increasing of this specific violence, but again, it's important to raise attention about the link between the online violence and the offline violence that uh, these women experience. This is for us uh, an important finding and is uh, linked to the aggressors. Most of the aggressors are uh, representatives of uh, the media where these women work. And in second place, uh, aggressors come from the state. I mean, uh, state representatives, I mean, uh, policemen, congressmen, uh, heads of uh, federal offices used to be uh, some of the main aggressors of women journalists. Also, uh, information sources, criminal groups, uh, private corpor corporations, and uh, what we have seen uh, also is the increase of um, violence coming from uh, narco groups and probably my colleague Lucia de Lagunes can explain further on this. Uh, for us, it was important to um, explore the impact of uh, this violence on uh, the integrity of these professionals. So what we can see here is that the effects are uh, multiple, either diverse. We can see here that uh, the effects are psychological, uh, economic, physical, and uh, these effects have also an effect on society as the self-censorship is a way for them to uh, protect uh, or to feel uh, protected of uh, further violence. So, um, uh, Guilherme Canela uh, also spoke about the impunity issue. Here, what we can see is that in Mexico, the level of impunity is uh, higher. We uh, could say that according to Article 19, 90% of um, those uh, acts of violence against women journalists are uh, on the impunity. And uh, of course, with the pandemic, these uh, conditions have worsened. Uh, we can see here that uh, most of these women, women journalists uh, have uh, moved to a part-time um, modality of their jobs, that uh, they have uh, now multiple tasks uh, for the same salary or even for a less uh, salary. And uh, so uh, in conclusion, what we can say uh, is that uh, the conditions of uh, women journalists in uh, Mexico uh, have worn it uh, the last few years. So now I would like to, to give the floor to my colleague, uh, Lucia Lagunes, uh, to introduce uh, the results uh, of the, our analysis of the national mechanism. Uh, Lucia, uh, por favor. 
Muchas gracias, Jaime, y muchas gracias a todas y todos por estar esta mañana, tarde, noche, dependiendo del lugar donde se encuentran, y acompañarnos en esta reflexión que eh, pues GAMAC ha impulsado en esta investigación. Efectivamente, como, como señala Jaime, el mecanismo de protección en México cumple este año 10 años, una década de existencia para la protección de periodistas y personas defensoras de derechos humanos. En estos 10 años, digamos, ha habido avances en la incorporación de la perspectiva de género, pero solo en dos dimensiones. Una que tiene que ver con el reconocimiento de la violencia sexual hacia las mujeres periodistas, prácticamente como el, el principal eh, motivo de género que pudieran eh, reconocer. Y otro tiene que ver con eh, una condición de su eh, maternidad ¿no? y su eh, eh, dependencia de otras personas. Sin embargo, el mecanismo como de, de protección hoy enfrenta eh, retos importantes en el sentido de que esta nueva ley que se está proponiendo por parte del gobierno mexicano implica que desarrollen en cada entidad federativa mecanismos locales. Estos mecanismos locales estarían a cargo de eh, los análisis de riesgo y de la eh, creación de los planes de protección para personas defensoras y periodistas. Eh, esta iniciativa que lanzó el gobierno mexicano en diciembre del 2021 y que ha iniciado unas eh, reuniones eh, estatales por entidades federativas, hasta el día de hoy hay cuatro que se han realizado, eh, no está garantizando la presencia de las mujeres periodistas para precisamente escuchar de viva voz lo que están enfrentando y cuáles tendrían que ser los elementos que habría que considerar para poder garantizar una verdadera perspectiva de género en sus análisis de riesgo y sus planes de protección. Aquellas periodistas que han logrado estar dentro de estos diálogos han señalado reiteradamente que no están de acuerdo en que las instancias estatales sean las responsables de su protección Toda vez que, como lo señala los resultados de la investigación, los agresores de las periodistas son agentes del Estado, agentes de entidades federativas, de los gobiernos de las entidades federativas, razón por la cual las propias periodistas han señalado que se sentirían mucho más en riesgo si sus propios agresores son los que tienen que protegerlas. Sin embargo, el gobierno federal no está escuchando precisamente las razones por las cuales las mujeres periodistas e incluso los compañeros varones han señalado su negativa a que este mecanismo de protección se eh, traslade a las entidades federativas por los riesgos que esto implicaría. Eh, porque los mecanismos como... Eh, eh, siguiendo el modelo del mecanismo federal, dependen del Ministerio del Interior, eh, que en México se conoce como la Secretaría de Gobernación. Si bien en su conformación cuenta con representantes de gobierno, es importante señalar que está la sociedad civil representada a través del Consejo Consultivo del Mecanismo de Protección. Y este Consejo Consultivo en el cual participamos mujeres feministas ha sido una pieza clave para, precisamente para impulsar dentro del Mecanismo de Protección una perspectiva más eh, integral y a favor de los derechos humanos de las mujeres periodistas y defensoras, porque este mecanismo eh, busca proteger a ambas eh, poblaciones, ¿sí? tanto periodistas como defensoras. Eh, como parte de esta investigación que realizamos con eh, las entrevistas que se llevaron a cabo y a profundidad, tanto con personas que forman parte de la estructura del mecanismo, como de aquellas instancias de autoridad que forman parte de la Junta de Gobierno, que es 
precisamente la instancia máxima del mecanismo de protección, me parece que hay lecciones aprendidas que podrían replicarse precisamente dentro de, eh, eh, del mecanismo. Y una de ellas creo que eh, tiene que ver efectivamente que con garantizar que aquellas unidades de género que están dentro de las instituciones gubernamentales sean eh, asesoras permanentes, cotidianas, en el trabajo que realiza el mecanismo de protección, tanto al momento de eh, las entrevistas con las mujeres periodistas, como al momento del diseño de la implementación del de, eh, análisis de riesgo y el plan de protección para superar una mirada que se tiene en el mecanismo de protección, que es una mirada eh, policial de la protección. Es decir, una mirada que se centra en, en acciones duras como pueden ser chalecos antibalas, eh, autos blindados, escoltas y que deja a un lado la visión de derechos humanos, que no garantiza precisamente que las mujeres periodistas sean reconocidas como sujetas de derechos humanos y no solo como objetos de protección, que es una de las miradas precisamente que se sigue manteniendo en esta propuesta de la nueva ley que está haciendo el gobierno mexicano y que como bien lo señalaba Aimé, Gener, podría generar mayor desprotección precisamente para las mujeres periodistas. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Lucia Lagunes. Uh, uh, so, uh, as said, uh, we plan to uh, publish uh, the report uh, by this year. So, we have come to the end of this first part of the joint session.